join me in welcoming Ryan to the stage. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hello. Good to see all of you here. Great to be here in Berlin with you. Uh, I run partnerships and content at Meta, and uh, I'm going to chat with you a little bit about how I think the world might see in 2020, which I'm going to have to explain to you because I'm in Germany, is a pun. The year 2020, 2020 vision. All right, I like to set a low bar at the beginning. So I had a childhood dream, which was to, when I got glasses, when I was about seven years old, to have my computer in my glasses. And I've been thinking about that for over 20 years now. And I feel like finally the technology and what I've been imagining are actually the same thing, which is really exciting. This was my first real foray, foray into AR. Uh, this was the Meta One. It was something I kickstarted. Uh, I wasn't at Meta yet, but when I got that, I was so excited because it was the first time I could really see holograms uh, and touch them and interact with them. And it wasn't great, but it was good enough to see the future of where we were headed. And I knew I wanted to be a part of this and I needed to make my life focused on this uh, because it has so much potential to change our world for the better. At Meta, we're bringing augmented reality to life. So I get the pleasure of working on this paradigm shifting technology and it's not just AR for the sake of AR, it's really about building a much more natural machine, a more natural way for us to interact with the digital world. And right now, we're really limited by the dimensions of our screens. Even the big iPhone is very small relative to our human field of view. And I want to break out of those limitations, not only dimensionally, but the flatness of those devices, because I'm not flat, and you guys aren't flat. We're 3D creatures, and if we want to interact with something, we grab it, we move it around. That's how our computers should work, because then we can eliminate the learning curve, and we can have a far more natural machine. And we can stop making these design concessions where we stuff all these buttons and menus and things into these devices that are so small and so flat. So we want to kill the metaphor. Instead of moving a mouse around and having it move on the screen, just be able to directly interact. So kill the metaphor, but not the metaphor. We would like that to be successful when it comes out. I told you there'd be bad puns. So what I'm really talking about is building something that works as a natural extension of you as opposed to something that you have to conform to and learn how to use, something that anyone can put on, whether they're a kid or a grandmother, and it's just intuitive because it works much closer to real life than how any digital device has ever worked before. This requires the invention of an entirely new kind of operating system. It's not Windows on your face. It's not Android on your face. It's something that's inherently spatial with volumetric tools that resemble things you've probably used in the real world more than something on your phone or your laptop. What I'm talking about is putting a digital layer on top of the real world that is contextually relevant to you, to your environment, to your social network, your family, your activities, your work. And it's not just one layer, it's a lot of layers that you can turn on or off for different purposes. This is the Meta 2. This is the device that I've been waiting for. And uh, I'll show you what this looks like. This is it. Some of you might have seen me walking around with it. It's pretty exciting to get to have it here. Of course, uh, it's got this nice big field of view now, which is what I think all of us have really been waiting for. It's 90 degrees diagonally. So I can pretty much see from here to here. So it really covers my whole human field of view. So four times bigger than Meta One or HoloLens, two and a half K resolution, direct hand manipulation. So you have a variety of sensors on top of the device. You have the SLAM cameras, which are two optical cameras with a 270 degree field of view. You can almost see behind your head. And what this enables is to keep track of virtual objects that you place in the real world and to have persistence. And this is filtered by our six axis IMU. And then of course we have a front facing HD camera as well, a microphone array. We've got surround sound built in, speaker here, here, and two in here. 
Uh, we've also got the depth sensor, which is a custom depth sensor with a larger field of view than even uh, the optics, so you can directly touch and move objects. So not this, not a metaphor, but that direct manipulation which we've been working so hard on. And this is something that is available now for pre-order, and it's going to start shipping uh, in the very near future. We're very excited about that. And I can tell you, based on pre-orders already, there's going to be tens of thousands of developers working with this device uh, in the next year. Uh, and it's really what those people create, the applications, the tools, the experiences that are going to pave the way from a development kit to much broader adoption. And of course, the form factor will get better and better uh, as time goes on as well. So I do want to say thank you to Pikachu for uh, all of his contributions and the excitement for AR. A lot of people knew AR, but they didn't necessarily uh, have any kind of experience with it. And now everyone from kids to adults understands it. The financial markets are excited about it. The investment community is pouring money into it. So even if you don't like Pokemon Go, uh, you can appreciate what it's done for our industry. Uh, at Meta, we have a very different philosophy in terms of how we interact. We study the field of neuroscience. We have a brilliant neuroscience team that does studies every single day to understand the most natural way for humans to interact with the digital world, with their environments, and with each other. And we're creating what we call neurointerface design principles, which we're open sourcing and giving away to our developers to help inform a much more natural interaction with the content, sort of this digital layer on top that they can treat as a first-class citizen. If we do it right, you forget you're wearing the glasses and you become one with this content. What I'm going to show you now is what you would experience if you came to our office in Silicon Valley and you put on the glasses. We literally filmed this through the glasses by putting a little Sony sort of pocket camera behind the lens of the glasses. There's no uh, post-production of any kind. This is all 100% authentic. You can even see the nose bridge sort of in the middle. Uh, so there's an iPad here because what we want to do is show you how we can extend the existing devices that are part of our lives on the path to displacing them completely. So what you're seeing right now is this direct hand interaction, the ability to very dexterously touch even an individual cube, and you can do crazy things like have them fall onto the world, have them fall into your hands, mold them like it's a big block of clay, and of course, this is just one example of how the system can work and how an object can be attached to another object that's a real object or a virtual object. The next part takes you on a little bit of an exploration of how we can extend these devices more directly and even place content on top. I'm sure you guys have all shopped on tablets, but we're going to take it a step further here. So the ability to then see this come out of your shopping experience and sort of rotate it around. You can actually even take it and look inside of it. The only thing it doesn't have is a smell. It's a new shoe, so. The next part that we're gonna get into is one of my favorite parts because this is where we start to enable people to create their very own holograms right inside of the device. And of course, you can imagine how this is great for work, for play, for shopping, for learning, for collaboration, for communication, for design, for so much more. This is my favorite thing to do. I go in the demo room all the time and I just use this to mock up interfaces that I want to see in the real world. So this is the ability to paint using a prototype pen that we built. Uh, we actually have a way now to do it without the pen, but not ready to show that to the world quite yet. Uh, but this is similar to what you've probably seen in VR with Tilt Brush, but this is painting in real life on top of the real world. And you can even use your hands and touch and manipulate the objects that you create inside of this environment. Uh, and of course, there's persistence too. This part gives me chills. This is something that gives me a sense of presence like I've never felt any other way. This is holographic communication. We have ways right now, live, for you to see me, for me to see you, we both wear the glasses, we have a cheap commoditized depth sensor in front of us or a collection of depth sensors, and we can see each other like we're really there together. You can be on the other side of the world, and soon we'll even be able to collaborate on a drawing together. So for me, this is like FaceTime on steroids, and 
it's the only way I've felt that I can get the kind of bandwidth that I get in person from not actually being together in person. I'll tell you a little secret. This is a device that is going to become very much like our phones, commoditized across the board in terms of how it looks. We're gonna to move towards this strip of glass. I think we'll get there before 2020, but of course, uh, I think by that time we'll have this very sleek pair of glasses, much closer to what we're uh, wearing on our faces, many of us now, than a device like this today. But this is about arming the developers. It's not about waiting to get to the magic form factor that's gonna sell 10 million units. It's about getting the development started now that's going to create those killer applications that's going to drive adoption, not for Meta, for our entire industry. Design, I think, will differentiate when you get to 2020. I don't think Versace and Armani and all these guys are just gonna go, nah, we don't care about that market anymore. They're gonna wanna continue to be part of it and they're gonna wanna start to differentiate with, I think, the designs and throwing other people's optical engines and software inside of them. I think this is about mobile disruption, ultimately. I think this is not what's meta like compared to HoloLens or Magic Leap. I think the bar of excellence is the usefulness of devices that have become ubiquitous with our lives today, our phones. It's gotta be so much better than what we do now. You can't just take the same application and put it on there. It's gotta be an evolution of that that works in a way that is so much better. You just can't afford to go back to that old way of doing it. That's what will drive that paradigm shift from the boxes on our desks and the rectangles in our pockets to having the whole world as our desktop background. And when we talk about true usefulness, there's an example that you've probably heard before, maybe not in AR, but there was an application called VisiCalc. It was one of the first spreadsheet applications. Uh, I think it was the first spreadsheet application. It was for Apple II, and it drove adoption of Apple II. Not because spreadsheets are cool, but because the alternative was terrible. The alternative was a paper binder called a ledger with a pencil and an eraser and manual calculations, and it was orders of magnitude more complex than using the spreadsheet application. So what happened, a ton of Macs, Apple IIs actually, were sold. And that created this giant user base, which was very attractive for all the software developers to create software for. This created an ecosystem, this drove the shift. And that's the kind of usefulness that we have to strive for as an industry in order to drive real true adoption, not just for specific use cases, but as a generalizable device that threatens all of the devices you're holding right now. Future technologies, some of these are my personal predictions, particularly this one. I think by 2030, we might transcend glasses. People always ask me, oh, what's next? When are you guys gonna have contacts? Uh, I don't know if anyone's gonna have contacts because I think we might get to a computer brain interface first. There's actually some research recently, if you guys have seen the future of storytelling, where they've been able to read the electrical signals from the brain using a neural network and translate it into an image of what the person is seeing in real time. That can go both ways. There's people working on it. I think by 2030, it could be a real thing. And maybe there is no optics in front of the eyes. Maybe you're just going directly into the brain. This is not something I'm saying Meta's doing. It's just a possibility of where we could go. 5G is gonna change everything for us. Talk about processing in the glasses. You don't even need to necessarily do it because you can have sub-millisecond latency with multi-gigabit throughput with these new 5G networks that will be widespread by 2020 or so. I think we're all gonna have photorealistic optics, just like your Android phone looks like your iPhone and is similar to your Samsung, except it doesn't explode. Uh, <laughs> I think we'll all have very similar looking optics and we can do all the processing in the cloud with this super low latency. And of course, so many advancements in computer vision are going to enable this persistence shared, maybe even across devices uh, on top of the world. So if you talk about use cases, People always want to know, well, what's it for? Uh, well, of course, there's entertainment. I think entertainment-wise, volumetric video is going to kill it. I've experienced a lot of volumetric video, and it's emotional. It's mind-blowing. There's artists who are creating amazing experiences, plays and movies and shows and uh, music videos and all kinds of stuff that's going to help define uh, this new kind of medium. It's kind of like figuring out film in the beginning they had to figure out what the cut was. There's so much we have to figure out with volumetric video. For 3D design, whether it's shoes or spaceships, for gaming, multiplayer with friends live or remote, 
education, for things like anatomy. We can learn so much faster. We can retain so much more information. And I had recently uh, one of the leaders uh, in China in the education system tell me, we have more students than you have people in your country, and we believe all students will be taught using augmented reality within the next couple of years because there's things that we just can't teach with a textbook that we can learn, like looking at anatomy and be able to pick apart a body life size. For medical imaging and surgery simulation, for training, whether it's astronauts or professional athletes, for complex assembly, whether it's a grill or a bike or a car or a plane or whatever it may be, for retail experiences, seeing maybe a car that's not out yet in the showroom, getting to even sit inside of it, honk the horn if you want, for e-commerce, trying on clothing, putting furniture in your home, maybe even ordering that IKEA furniture and then having to tell you how to put it together once it arrives. For monitor replacements, taking our existing applications on the path to displacement and putting them in front of us and having unlimited monitors even when we're on the road. The internet of things connecting to our homes and our smart factories. For government, for city planning, for training, for data visualization, and one of my personal favorites, holographic communication and maybe even when that brain interface kicks in, a form of ESP. What I'm trying to get across to you is not the things that AR is limited to, but that in fact the possibilities are endless. It's not what is it good for, it's what isn't it good for, and the answer is swimming because it's not waterproof yet. So what I'm saying is in a few short years, I think we'll be kissing our phones and our laptops and our TVs goodbye, and thank you so much, Berlin, for having me.